There are many shows dedicated to Magic the Gathering strategies, decks, and formats. But unlike all of them, this channel is about discussing an individual card, an isolated card, an unrelated card. This is an Magic Card. Hello again, internet friends, and welcome to this, the 10th installment of An Magic Card, the YouTube TV show where I exhaustively discuss a randomly selected magic card. My name is ostensibly Dusty Cupboards, and as always, we're about to give the comments from the last video a long, hard look-see before diving into our main topic. Frequent commenter IRL Fine Gaming points out that Tolkien's spelling of dwarves was not a typo, but an intentional stylistic choice. I'm glad somebody pointed this out because I actually spent quite a bit of time getting to the bottom of this for my last video. I was personally under the impression that it was a typo, but when looking to verify this, because I'm a thorough and reliable internet nonsense contributor, everything I found referenced Appendix F from The Hobbit, where J.R.R.R. Tolkien himself states that it was an intentional choice. But when looking into this further, we can uncover a web of lies more tangled than the den of Shiloh. There are letters where Tolkien both confirms and denies it as a mistake, but in a 1965 BBC interview, he finally clarifies both the truth that it was a typo and his rather successful attempts to cover up that fact. Amuses me to say because I suppose I'm in a position which it doesn't matter what people think of me now. Some frightful mistakes in grammar from a professor of English language literature rather shocking. Yeah. I haven't noticed any. Well, there's one where I use bestrode as a past passive of bestride. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of things like that, yeah. Yes, there are some. And of course, dwarves are really mistake in grammar, of course. I've tried to cover it up, but, but it's just purely the fact that. Uh, I have a tendency to uh, to increase the number of these vestigial approvals, which is a change of constant, like leaf leaves. Oh no, began in thirty. Some of the was out in the thirties. In that interview, he also says some horribly anti-Semitic things, which leads us into our next comment. Dreadmaw the Gathering left a Dreadmaw-sized comment, asking why in a video talking about representation in fantasy fiction, I didn't even touch on the pervasive use of fantasy races like dwarves to represent and misrepresent Jews throughout history. And considering that I talk quite a bit about Tolkien, who himself in no uncertain terms describes his dwarves as being a stand-in for the Jewish people, I will admit that it's a little bit odd not to get into that subject. And I did certainly consider it, especially considering the flavor text on both versions of Dwarven Trader. But as somebody who grew up hyper aware of anti-Semitism, it's something that I'm not especially excited to talk about. And if I did want to get into it, my videos would probably end up being far longer than 35 minutes. It's a discussion that's worth having, and I'm really grateful that Dreadmob brings it up here so that I can mention it and make note of it, but in a way which is not all consuming. Carl1357 basically confessed to being the individual who gave episode number 8 a thumbs down. They decided not to give me the pleasure of another thumbs down, but fortunately for me, I'm more than capable of disliking my own videos. Friend of the channel, Max of Lords, let me know that they really enjoy when I discuss the flavor text on cards, which was notably absent in the last video, despite the fact that, as already mentioned, Dwarven Trader has not one but two really interesting and slightly anti-Semitic flavor texts. Well, good news, Max of Lords. I most definitely didn't write the entire script and record it and edit it for this week's video, completely forgetting to talk about the flavor text. And I'm most definitely not going to have to go now and write a new section about the flavor text, which I forgot to write about, and then find somewhere in the video, which I've already written and recorded and edited, and then insert that section in there somewhere awkwardly in a place that will only kind of make sense to talk about the flavor text. So look forward to that. Having succinctly and completely answered all of those inquiries, we can now bite into the main subject for this video, one of the most recognizable cards in the history of the gathering most magical. <sighs> all right, so we got our, uh, our our dwarves who trade, both both versions, both this version and this version. And uh, and then also we have our new card for the week, for the, for the two weeks. Uh, oh, sweet, okay. Um, yeah, I totally know this card. This is Nat Miser. I actually, I, I like this card. I, this is not a, I feel like a lot of these videos are, are cards I've never even heard of. This is a card I have heard of. I have heard of this one. Cause Nat Miser is kind of my jam. And, uh, and we're gonna, I guess we're gonna talk about it for a, a really long time. Whoosh. 
Nat Miser is a 1 mana 1-1 one, one black rat shaman creature and card number 70 from Saviors of Kamigawa. Released on Friday, June 3rd, 2005, Saviors of Kamigawa was the 35th expansion and the third and final set in Kamigawa block. Kamigawa block came out in that time period where the ducks were usually big and then small and then small again. To me, this is the most iconic block structure, even though it's been abandoned for quite a while now. And in the future, instead of saying big set, small set, small set, I'm simply going to refer to this block structure as the Mama Duck strolling along with her two baby ducklings paradigm, which can be abbreviated as MDSAWHTBDP to save time and make things easier to understand. It's easy to identify the three sets which appeared in Kamigawa block because they are all something of Kamigawa. Prior to Saviors of Kamigawa, which can be abbreviated as SOK, came the middle set, Betrayers of Kamigawa, which can be abbreviated as BOK, and before that was the first set, Champions of Kamigawa, which is of course abbreviated as CHK. So logically, in the MDSAWHTBDP, CHK is the MD and BOK and SOK are the TBD. Pretty self-explanatory. The set symbols for these expansions are a Tori Gate, a Shuriken, and a Lantern. The code names for these three sets were Earth, Wind, and Fire, an allusion to the genre-spanning American music group with the same hydrophobic moniker. In classical Greek thought, the four elements are Earth, Water, Air, and Fire, but the founder of Earth, Wind, and Fire chose the band's name based on his astrological sign of Sagittarius, which is aligned with only three of those four elements, taking into account the seasonal elements in both the northern and southern hemispheres. In addition to the sign's basic element, in ancient Japanese things, Thinking, there were actually five elements, with the addition of void or heaven. But I'm not going to get into that right now because we're going to have to talk about a lot of Japanese stuff in this video, and I don't want to wear down your capacity for strange Japanese folklore before we even get to the lore section. If you awoke on the morning of June 3rd, 2005, ready to walk down to your local game store and tear into some booster packs of Saviors of Kamigawa, you would in all likelihood take a brief moment to reflect on the fact that only 40 years prior to that day, American astronaut Ed White became the first human being to perform an extravehicular activity, what is now known as a spacewalk, after ascending to the heavens aboard the Gemini 4 rocket. Gemini is also an astrological sign, and if you wanted to start a funk band based around extravehicular activity, you could apply the same nonsense astrological analysis, which yielded the band name Earth, Wind, and Fire, to come up with a similar band name Earth, Water, and Fire to describe that spaceship, which kind of makes sense because there is no wind in space, but there's also not really any earth, water, or fire. Space seems to be mostly filled with void. It's almost as if the philosophers of ancient Japan knew more than we give them credit for. At some point on June 3rd, 2005, in between listening to the song My Humps on your iPod and drafting Saviors of Kamigawa in person at your local game store without wearing facial coverings or being concerned about deadly internationally prevalent airborne pathogens, you would most likely have taken note of the fact that it was also the birthday of notorious Roman prefect Lucius Aelius Sejanus, who was responsible for raising the political influence of the Praetorian Guard, who had previously been a simple regiment of bodyguards. If he hadn't been executed on suspicion of conspiracy, I'm gonna drink a little bit of coffee right now. Coffee break. Ugh. That is pretty good coffee. If he hadn't been executed on suspicion of conspiracy, Sejanus would have turned 2025 on the day that Saviors of Kamigawa released. Sadly, his life was cut short, and we will never know what he thought about the cards contained therein, or the Black Eyed Peas hit song, My Humps. If you are a newer player and you aren't super familiar with Kamigawa, it's a plane inspired by Japanese folklore, and its primary story involves a war between the human occupants of that world and the Kami, who occupy the spirit realm. According to the internet, the human lands are known as Utsushio, and the domain of the spirits is known as Kakuryo, or Raikai. The word Raikai comes up occasionally on cards throughout the set, but I've never heard the words Kakuryo or Utsushio in my gosh darn life. Apparently, the word Kakuryo appears in the flavor text of Rushing Tide Zubera, so I guess I'm just not a real magic fan, and my whole life is one giant lie. Also, I'm going to mispronounce almost all of the Japanese words in this video, so feel free to lambast my poor elocution ruthlessly in the comment section below. I grew up watching bootleg Inuyasha VHS tapes, but apparently that has not translated into expert level Japanese diction. The word Kamigawa means river of the divine, and alludes to the river of the divine, which separates the plane into the material world and the spiritual world. The central conflict of Kamigawa involves the human daimyo, Lord Takeshi Kanda, sneaky boy tiptoeing into the spirit realm, and stealing a precious MacGuffin from the king 
king of all kami, Okagachi, whose name translates to Big Mouthed Rope, which I, I really cannot overstate how much I, I enjoy that fact. The item Lord Konda took has its own card, which is very prosaically named That Which Was Taken. Prior to being taken, one can only imagine it was called That Which Has Yet To Be Taken, although the true MacGuffin is not the disc, but what it contains, the daughter of Okagachi. His daughter is what granted Okagachi his invulnerability, and her imprisonment in that shiny moon orb is why Lord Konda has indestructibility on his card in Champions of Kamigawa. As any good father snake spirit would do, Okagachi spends the entirety of Kamigawa block trying to retrieve this artifact, and many utterly bizarre spirits that inhabit his realm are enlisted to help in the fight. Okagachi trying to retrieve that which was taken is quite literally the plot from the film Taken, and by pure coincidence, I'm pretty sure Liam Neeson's character in that film was also named Big Mouth Rope. As far as plot devices go, this Taken daughter thing isn't necessarily the most creative one, but I'm still kind of into it. In the 1992 film Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, you have a similar situation, where scientists take Godzilla's egg, and then the ensuing radioactive dinosaur rampage results from that transgression. Baby Godzilla in that film is also very cute, much cuter than the stupid and ugly looking Manila from the 1967 film Son of Godzilla. If anybody watching this video personally knows Manila from the 1967 film Son of Godzilla, please let them know that I hate them. This basic structure of Angry Monster Mom is likely present in innumerable stories stretching back through the eons. Although off the top of my head, I can only really think of a few examples, like the annoying Pokemon movie where Lugia screams constantly, and at least two of the Jurassic Park films. In the end of Kamigawa Block, Michiko, the daughter of Lord Konda, frees Kyodai, the daughter of Okagachi, and the two of them join forces to end the conflict between their overbearing fathers. This is kind of a great ending, as the daughter of Okagachi who is treated as a literal object by both Kanda and her own father, is given agency, and the ecumenical wisdom of these two young ladies prevails over the power-hungry aspirations of their tyrannical fathers. They also graphically mutilate both Lord Kanda and Okagachi, though, turning them into a pile of dust and a headless garden snake, respectively, which seems a bit extreme to me. But okay. Together, Michiko and Kyodai now rule the plain of Kamigawa as the sisters of flesh and spirit. We've never seen a non-disc depiction of Kyodai, but apparently she looks just like Michiko, except in serpent form. Which strikes me as a very odd description, as being a serpent and perfectly resembling a person seems somewhat mutually exclusive. All of this neat lore stuff is why many enfranchise magic fans are big on Kamigawa. The same cannot be said though for the mechanics of the set however, and this combined with the Byzantine nature of the story lead it to being considered one of the least successful products in the history of Magic the Gathering. On the scale used by the fun uncle of Magic the Gathering, Mark Rosewater, to forecast the likelihood of any given world returning, Kamigawa currently has a 7 out of 10, which is not great, but it used to have an 8 out of 10, so I, I guess that's an improvement. Some of these key mechanics from Kamigawa block are spirit tribal payoffs, arcane spells, shrines, flip cards, legendary cards, ninjas, and hand size matters. Ninjas and their signature ability, ninjutsu, are the one thing that really landed with players from Kamigawa, and this tribe and mechanic have returned multiple times in new magic products to great success. Literally every other mechanic from the entire block, however, is basically a complete dud. The spirit tribe still exists, but soul shift and key counters are not remembered fondly by most. People like shrines and arcane spells, but they are still more of a fringe novelty than anything else. Flip cards are largely considered a mistake, and the legendary theme in Kamigawa likely helped contribute to the popularity of EDH to some degree, but the execution was pretty bad. Hand size matters, sometimes known as wisdom, is an often overlooked aspect of Kamigawa block though, and this is where things start to get a little bit miserly. From a design standpoint, there was some pretty interesting overlap among Kamigawa block's unpopular and feeble mechanics, and when played in a closed environment, the gameplay can actually be really fun. My IRL buddy who I've mentioned before in episode number 3, has a really great Kamigawa cube. Outside of that context, many Kamigawa cards become much more straightforward though, and that's definitely the case for our rat shaman friend here. I own a copy of Nat Miser, and I know this for a fact, because I love Nat Miser. I also love Locust Miser. To a certain extent, I even love Bone Miser and Miser's Cage. Although it's a bit awkward that Miser's Cage damages opponents for having 5 or more cards in their hand, and both Nat Miser and Locust Miser reduce their hand size 
guys. To make that impossible, Bone Miser similarly rewards you for discarding cards. And since the Rat Misers only affect opponents, they have no bearing on Bone Miser. So a Miser theme deck is probably not really going to come together. A Miser is a person who hoards something. So Nat Miser has a lot of gnats. And Locust Miser has a lot of locusts. I'm a big fan of the depressing musician Elliot Smith. And his early band was called Heat Miser, named after the character from the Rankin Bass stop motion animated Christmas special, The Year Without Santa Claus. This is probably at least in part what draws me to these miserly cards. Also, rats are very cute. Much cuter than the stupid and ugly looking Manila from the 1967 film Son of Godzilla. And magic cards which change the underlying rules of the game are something that appeals to me. Hand size is one of the most fundamental parts of Magic the Gathering, and it's often taken for granted. The notion that you start the game with seven cards and can't hold more than seven cards at any one time becomes almost second nature. I experienced this second naturedness quite vividly some years back when I was creating my own card game about World War I with puppies and kittens. I was well into developing the rules for that game before I even realized that I had to decide how many cards the player would start with and the ramifications that this would have on the way the game played out. Having played Magic since I was a young child, I almost just assumed that a hand would consist of seven cards, like a young foal being born with the ability to run without ever considering if maybe it would rather stand upright or walk backwards. I also played the Pokemon trading card game as a child, which having been developed by Wizards of the Coast, retains the seven card hand size, although it has no set hand size limit. Apparently in Yu-Gi-Oh, which I've never played in my life, the starting hand size is four and the limit is six. Force of Will, a game which is literally named after a magic card, also has the seven card starting hand size and hand size limit. Hand size in many playing card games is uniform, as the cards themselves are what determine the outcome of the games, and cards aren't really seen as a resource. In the game Uno, your hand size is basically the entire game, as you try and reduce it to zero. Nat Miser would therefore be a terrible card in Uno. Outside of the context of Kamigawa, Nat Miser isn't necessarily a great card in Magic either. Your opponents generally want to have more cards in their hand, and reducing the total that they can hold will occasionally make them discard those precious rectangles, thus reducing their options on subsequent turns. Reducing their hand size by one won't often be a huge setback though, since in most formats it's rare that an opponent ends their turn with a full seven cards. If you have multiple misers out, the pressure starts to mount, but like a single gnat, a single gnat miser isn't likely to cause many problems. Causing players to discard can have some upsides, and this is where I've previously considered running the misers. In the Harlem Globetrotters exhibition game format, EDH. Discard decks are popular, and cards like Waste Not and Geth's Grimoire are popular payoffs for making your opponents put cards from their hands into their graveyards. We've seen this archetype get support recently with cards like Tiny Bones, the world's cutest skeleton, and Turgrid, the new hotness from Kaldheim. I have a black discard deck, and I've considered switching to Turgrid, but I'm a big old hipster, so if she gets too popular, or people get tired of playing against her, I'll probably abstain. None of these discard focused commanders are making room for the misers though, except for the bone miser. There's room for that miser. Instead, we're seeing both locust miser and gnat miser showing up mostly in Maronar and Sizon decks. Sizon is a funny commander which seeks to make people discard by overwhelming them with card draw. And it makes sense that shrinking their hand size would play well into that plan. I've played against my friend's Sizon deck multiple times. I enjoy playing against my friend's Sizon deck. I enjoy my friend's Maronar, on the other hand, doesn't really care about hand size or discard. Maronar just loves rats. Rats as a tribe go pretty far back in Magic the Gathering and have maintained an identity of small, swarming, often diseased, and occasionally bipedal black creatures. The humanoid rats of Kamigawa, including Nat Miser, are known as the Nizumi, which translates into English as mouse or rat. And now is the part of the video where I talk about the flavor text. Nizumi insect shamans enjoyed solitary lives, which was fortunate since no other Nizumi could stand to live within half a mile of their foul stench. This flavor text is a little bit odd to me because it's implying that the insects are what generate the stench. And outside of a few exceptions, I think I would generally say that rodents actually smell stronger than insects, but I guess maybe if you are a rodent yourself, you get used to the smell. I like the fact that this flavor text gives us a clear picture that rat shamans like Nat Miser are seen as eccentric outcasts living hermetic lives, far from the swarms of their rodent brethren. The Nizumi. Regardless of where they come from though, lots of rats, like Rat Colony, Pestilence Rats, Swarm of Rats, Pack Rat, Relentless Rats, and Plague Rat 
rats, the original rat card, all get stronger in greater numbers. Marinar EDH decks often embrace this swarm style, and since there are only 55 rat cards, it makes sense that any random rat might show up there, although you can run any number of both Rat Colony and Relentless Rats. I'm happy to see Natmizer getting any amount of play, and showing up in over 800 decks is pretty good, and something that similar cheap cards with relevant tribes like Dwarven Trader can aspire to. Discard is something that rats are also very consistently associated with, but I'm tired of listing cards, so look at the screen now to see a bunch of rats that cause players to discard cards. Wow, look at all those rats. There they go. That's a hefty chunk of rat-related discard. Patron of the Nizumi is also a good home for these discard rats, because despite not being a rat itself, it can consume rats to become cheaper through the ability Rat Offering. Its ability to make your opponents lose a whopping one life is a huge payoff for all of your dedicated discard spells. I'm realizing now that as I read this, that talking about Patron of the Nizumi would be an excellent time to segue into talking about my wonderful patrons over on Patreon, but it's 10.30 at night right now, and as a rule, I don't revise my script, so I'll just talk about my wonderful patrons at the end of the video. See you in 15 minutes, patrons! It should be noted that Natmizer interacts weirdly with cards that grant players an unlimited hand size. The number of cards that manipulate hand sizes in general is pretty small, with only 33 cards that alter the hand size rules, and among those, 19 grant their owner, or all players, no maximum hand size. When people think about maximum hand size, they might immediately think of Reliquary Tower, or Spellbook, or Thought Vessel. There are also some non-permanent spells which grant permanent hand size expansion, so make sure you have a scrap of paper ready to write that down. If your opponents have one of these unlimited hand size effects, and you cast Natmizer, you can smirk and chuckle confidently knowing that those poor suckers can now only have infinity minus one cards in their hands. You just made their infinity smaller. If two of your opponents have a reliquary tower out, giving them infinite hand size, but one of them also has a Manamo scroll keeper, and then you cast a Natmizer, then the person with the scroll keeper will have a bigger infinity than the other player. This is very important for reasons we'll discuss later. There are some cards that don't reduce or increase a player's hand size, but instead set a specific limit. The card recycles as well as its color shifted copy Null Profusion, make your maximum hand size 2. Midnight Oil is a very cool and complicated card which makes your maximum hand size 7, and then it makes your maximum hand size 5, and then it makes your maximum hand size 3, and then it makes your maximum hand size 1. For complicated reasons, I won't get into. Feel free to pause the video now and read the card. So what happens if your hand size is infinite, but also set to 2, or 7, or 5, or 3, or 1? Well this is the point in this channel's lifespan where I have to talk about layers. Layers are the VIP club of Magic the Gathering rules. For the most part, the rules of Magic the Gathering are open and transparent, meant to be both understood and interacted with by the average player. Layers are an exception, as they are necessary to resolve certain contradictory situations, but generally aren't something most players are intended to know about. Layers aren't actually complicated though. They simply state that when two effects paradoxically interact, then the newest one takes precedence. So if you have a Reliquary Tower out, and then you cast Recycle, and then you cast Thought Nibbler, and then you cast Thought Vessel, and then you cast Null Profusion, and then you cast Library of Lang, and then you cast Midnight Oil, and then you cast Trusted Advisor, and then you cast Thought Devourer, and then you cast Thought Eater, you will have a hand size of 2 until your next turn, when you will have a hand size of 0. The infinite hand size grants by cards like Reliquary Tower can be altered by cards that set a new hand size, and then that new hand size can be adjusted by cards that affect your maximum hand size. But then if you play a new card that gives you unlimited hand size, once again you will have unlimited hand size. I'm quite fond of these blue creatures from Odyssey that use hand size reduction as a drawback, and I think that there could be more hand size nonsense in Magic the Gathering beyond the more common infinite hand size mechanic. If you work at Wizards of the Coast and want to hear my bad ideas about how to make weird magic cards, please send me an email at dustycupboards1995 at hotdudes.net. Which reminds me, I haven't yet sent an email to the artist for this week's card. I'll do that now so that I don't miss out on the humbling experience of being completely ignored. When you're a big time YouTube TV star like myself, it's important to stay humble. Surprise surprise though, Thomas Baxa actually responded to my email, which is a first for this channel. He actually responded very quickly too, but simply stated that he prefers letting his work speak for itself, which is actually very wise. I think too often we let the analytical 
gamer part of our brains extend into areas like art appreciation and start trying to find objective truths. The reality with all artwork is that your experience as the viewer and your interpretation of what it means or represents is as valid as anybody's, and that the varied ways that individuals can react to a painting are all relevant when considering its effectiveness. For me personally, the artwork for Nat Miser is very effective on a number of levels, at least several of which involve me being very distressed about the idea of being covered in gnats. Mr. Boxa has illustrated 118 cards in the history of Magic the Gathering, beginning in the set Tempest and continuing up until just this past year, when he had some new artwork featured in Double Masters. In my communication with Mr. Boxa, I mentioned how distinct his art style is while still feeling at home within the larger context of Magic the Gathering art. I could most likely pick one of his pieces out of a lineup of Magic card illustrations, but that doesn't detract from the cohesion that those pieces might have. The first thing that stands out to me with any of Box's paintings is his use of expressive line work to create an extreme sense of motion, which combined with his penchant for high contrast can imbue his pieces with a disorienting, whirling, and mesmerizing quality. Lots of Box's pieces also make heavy use of contour lines to help denote volume, which is a technique I'm more used to seeing in drawing than painting, but which gives his work a great sense of rhythm and juxtaposes against the fluid striations which he uses to denote tendrils and vines and musculature. To rely upon the most oblique of art history touchstones, you can see similarities between Box's art and the freewheeling curvilinear brushstrokes of the post-impressionist Vincent van Gogh. Although to be honest, I like Box's work much more than Vincent van Gogh's. To be honest, I kinda don't like Vincent van Gogh. If you're watching this video and you personally know Vincent van Gogh, please let him know that I don't really care for his artwork. In dialogue, Boxa mentions both H.R. Geiger and Lucian Freud, who I think are much more worthwhile comparisons. Geiger and his ability to create unsettling vignettes, and Freud's loose but masterful brushwork. More than any artist I've talked about on this channel, I feel like Box's art greatly benefits from a closer inspection, and seeing the oil paintings at full size is a feast for the eyeballs. The hand of the artist is clearly visible in many of these paintings. The sketchy, quick motion that Boxa makes while painting turns his works into a visual record of his very movements. The confidence that it takes to commit such decisive marks to a painting is something that an artist has to accumulate over time. And even though some of the pieces which we're looking at are decades old, they were created with such visceral brushwork that with many of them you could be convinced that the paint is still liquid on the Bristol board. Based on interviews I've found with Thomas, he sounds like a very kind person, and while his paintings tend to depict gruesome, foul, and unnerving scenes, they retain a sense of loving attention. You can tell that he has a great fondness for these disgusting ghouls. Throughout much of his portfolio, and especially his illustrations for magic cards, we can spot a keen sense of color, with a preference towards ruddy browns and inky black but often veering into bright red or blue, and commonly employing different light sources and bold accent colors. Box's background in comic art certainly contributes to much of his dramatic framing and intense contrast. One of the things I'm a real sucker for in painting is the washed out lowlights that you see in distant scenery, and Box has got some great examples of that. Nat Miser itself is a bit of an anomaly among Box's magic art though. Compositionally it has some of the whirling elements that define many of his pieces, and the tone and subject are certainly great enough to fit alongside his other ghastly figures, but the painting is much more restrained and flat compared to the wild expressive strokes seen in many of his other paintings. The gnats themselves could explain this deviation though, as they are mostly rendered through loose frantic stippling and even some light splatters. I could see Boxa choosing to paint the rat shaman character in a less dynamic way so that these swarms of insects would stand out more against the flat tones of its sickly body. The light coloration of the rat is also probably chosen to achieve this effect. The contorted hands of the Nizumi might actually be the most disquieting thing in this picture, and the wisps of mystic energy flowing off of them mimic the clouds of gnats to help imply that the rodent is controlling them. The color scheme of this piece fits well within the murky range of much of Box's portfolio, and perhaps owing again to the overwhelming necessity of the gnats, the background here is even less developed than many of his other pieces, with only a single lantern giving us the vague inference of a setting. Overall, I like this piece, but I wouldn't count it as my favorite Thomas Boxer card art. I like how the bugs in the bottom right corner are larger and more detailed to give us a sense of depth as they recede ever smaller into the enveloping swarm. The metallic details and tones on the character's torso tie
tie this piece most closely to the bulk of Box's work. My favorite Thomas Box artwork is probably Vesper Ghoul, although I also really like Metamorphic Worm, which was mentioned in a previous episode. He also illustrated this dwarf, which appeared in the last episode, and this Noggle. Everybody loves Noggles. The sheer consistency of his work makes picking favorites difficult. His most recognizable pieces might be Soulless One, or Blightning, or Relentless Rats, which we've already mentioned once in this video, for being both rats and for being relentless. On his website you can buy his original artwork, and you bet your sweet cheeks if the artwork for Noggle Bridge Breaker was available, I would sell my collection of didgeridoos to buy it. As mentioned at the beginning of this video, I do also really like Nat Miser. It's got a lot going for it, from the creepy artwork, to the interesting mechanic, to the vermin allegiance, and the discard synergies, and also the flavor text. Despite all of this, I still haven't found a good excuse to play Nat Miser though. I have no plans to build a Nat theme deck. It is currently popper legal, but it's not really popper plausible. And its secondary creature type, Shaman, is little more than a catch-all for primitive Jun mystics. And with Warlock being recently added to the list of spellcasters who aren't quite wizards, we will likely start to see Shamans even less. Alas, my copies of Nat Miser are seemingly doomed to sit unused in the worn cardboard storage boxes I've owned since I was in middle school. Don't let the label fool you, there are definitely magic cards in there. Earlier in the video I actually already mentioned one great place where I can use Nat Miser though. This is like one of those movies where somebody goes on a journey to find their destiny and then realizes that everything they needed was right where they started. Kamigawa has a reputation for having terrible cards with stupid mechanics and bizarre flavor, but that's only when held up against cards from other expansions. People often explain the overall failure of Kamigawa block as being partially due to the fact that it followed the incredibly overpowered Mirrodin block and preceded the wildly popular Ravnica block. Mirrodin was so degenerate that it almost killed magic, and Ravnica was so successful that it probably saved magic. Kamigawa is the pretty decent indie band that somehow got scheduled to play between a grade school recorder ensemble and the Beatles. The grade school recorder ensemble scared everybody away, and by the time the Beatles took the stage, everybody had forgotten about Kamigawa. People like Ravnica so much that Wizards of the Coast essentially made it the capital of the multiverse, stealing that title away from the big big plane of Dominaria, which played host to nearly all of the early sets. You can tell that Ravnica is the most central plane now because it's the one which is now getting invaded. Being invaded is a privilege that only the residents of the most popular plane get to experience. Just ask Domri Raid about that. Remember Domri Raid? He was a plucky child with a rambunctious spirit who was murdered horribly by a candy coated bone daddy. Within the safe confines of Kamigawa block though, things might be a bit eccentric and a bit parasitic, but everything is cozy and copacetic. Except for Umizawa's Jite. Let's just pretend that's from Mirrodin. This is where Nat Miser makes the most sense, and this is where we can find some of the overlooked brilliance in Kamigawa's strange designs. Twice already I've alluded to the fact that the greater context of Kamigawa block is important for understanding our bug hoarding maze runner. The mechanics of Kamigawa suffer perceptually due to this needed context, and also due to their perceived power to cost ratio. Many players familiar with Kamigawa will comment on how incredibly expensive everything is. Crawling filth is a 6 mana 2-2 with fear. Compare that to regular filth, which is a 4 mana 2-2 with swamp walk. Crawling filth seems laughably bad, but it does have the ability soul shift 5, which means that when it dies you get to return a spirit that costs 5 or less from your graveyard to your hand. Does this make you want to pay 6 mana for a 2-2? Probably not, but within the context of Kamigawa, soul shift is actually pretty good. If you are drafting Kamigawa, soul shift is very legit, but when most people look at crawling filth, that doesn't really come to mind. Kamigawa also has the mechanic sweep, which might have the worst optics of any mechanic ever. To use sweep you have to return your own basic lands to your hand. That's right, you need to bounce your own precious lands to use these cards. You can only play one land per turn, and after slowly playing them out turn after turn, you are now asked to undo all of that for a one-time effect. People despise this mechanic. On the scale which Mark Rosewater, the cool uncle of Magic the Gathering, uses to forecast the likelihood of any given mechanic returning, sweep simply has no number, because I guess nobody likes sweep enough to even ask? Because nobody cares. With both sweep and soul shift though, again context is important. We need to remember that Kamigawa block has a hand size theme. When you return lands to your hand, those lands go to your hand. When you return a spirit from your graveyard to your hand, that spirit also goes to your hand. When you return an unblocked attacker to ninjutsu out a ninja, that unblocked attacker goes back to your hand. When you cast Evermind by splicing it onto an arcane spell, you get to draw a card and Evermind stays in your hand. There is a really interesting interplay between the confusing and terrible mechanics of Kamigawa, and within the confines of that environment, they can create some great moments. Imagine this. You have 
seven cards in hand, so you ninjutsu out an Okiba Gang Shinobi by returning an unblocked attacker. Because of ninjutsu, you still have seven cards in hand, which means that when your crawling filth dies, you can soul shift back a Kiyomaro first to stand, and then cast it. Kiyomaro has power equal to the number of cards in your hand, so it is currently a 7-7 with vigilance that gains you seven life whenever it deals damage. You have a removal spell in your hand for your opponent's only creature, meaning that on the next turn, when you draw your card and go up to eight cards in hand, and then cast that removal spell to go back down to seven cards, then your opponent will have no blockers, and you will be able to swing in with your 7-7 and your 3-2, dealing a total of 10 damage. Uh-oh, your opponent is currently at 15 life though. But wait, looking at your hand, you realize that you also have a plow through Rido. You can use plow, th what is it called? Plow through the Rido? What is it? Plow through the through Rido. If you cast that spell, it will leave your hand, and Kiyomaro will become a 6-6. But Plow Through Raido has Sweep, and you can choose to return all three of your planes back to your hand, which will then make Kiyomaro into a 9-9. And then because of Plow Through Raido, you can give Kiyomaro an additional plus 3 plus 3, which would make it a 12-12. Which means that alongside your Rat Ninja, you can swing in to deal exactly 15 damage. Game, set, match. You've got your opponent right where you want them. Or you would have them right where you want them. Except that you forgot that the one blocker which your opponent has is a Nat Miser. And Nat Miser reduces your hand size from 7 to 6. You currently have 7 cards in your hand, which means Kiyomaro is a 7-7. But at the end of your turn, you will have to discard a card. And you will only have 6 cards in your hand. And then next turn when you draw a card, you will go up to 7 cards, and then back down to 6 cards, and then up to 9 cards. And so Kiyomaro will be be an 11 11 oh my gosh it's really complicated but it's also kind of neat and that's why i love nat miser game set nats Alright everybody, that is episode number 10. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can. But I'm not going to tell you where it is. It's like a scavenger hunt. And you're the only person playing. A few days ago, somebody posted on Reddit saying that my channel is the most underappreciated channel in the universe. Uh, and, and I did appreciate that sentiment, and I really, uh, I really enjoyed the nice things that they had to say. But I want to let all of you who are watching this know that I feel like my channel is sufficiently appreciated. That each and every one of you who puts your eyeballs onto my nonsense videos is an entire human being, and I am well aware of that. And I hope that all of you entire human beings out there find some enjoyment in doing so. And I hope all of you entire human beings out there will join me again next time on Air Magic Con.